So I'm really pleased to welcome today Reg Williams from the um, Institute of Aging and Chronic Disease. And she's, um, I'm happy that she took the challenge on even she's not totally related to risk communication, but her insight and her experience uh, might be very useful and very important for us as well. And she's currently, um, please correct me, Rachel, if I'm saying something wrong about your, <laughs> your <laughs> current position, interim head of Department of Eye and Vision Side and deputy dean of Institute of Life Course and Medical, Medical Sciences. And her 25 years experiences um, is really deep involved in designing and developing new advanced materials for medical application. I think um, if you want to say a bit more about your experience, you're more than welcome. And <laughs> I think you're doing far more better than I am. And I'm happy to welcome all our guests and, and listen to this um, talk today. And um, we are having talk from, from Rachel right now. And if you want to interact and ask some questions, please, please feel free to. And if the audience would like to answer some questions or ask some questions, either put it in the chat or raise your hand and I will make sure you're getting heard. So Rachel, you can start. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I, I am going to uh, put a disclaimer at the beginning here so that I'm not actually going to mention risk uh, throughout this talk, um, but what I what I uh, I'm going to do is just talk to you about my experiences of of communicating science to different audiences. And this was something that came up when Elfrida and I were talking, and we thought it might be uh, of interest to people. So just to sort of put you um, in in context here, uh, let me just set my slides. We're going to move on. I'll do this. Yep. Uh, let, let me just sort of tell you where where I come from um, and, and what my background is. So I'm originally an engineer, um, and yet I've really, for my whole career, have been involved in working very much with clinicians uh, to, to look at how engineering can help in terms of uh, looking at new treatment options, shall we say. Um, but as an, as an academic in this area, uh, I've actually interacted with a huge number of different people. This really is an interdisciplinary science, if you want to call it biomedical engineering. And throughout my career, therefore, I, I've had to learn, and it's not always easy, how to communicate with a lot of different people. So, and, and I've put here, you know, I put ophthalmic bioengineering. This is what I think I do now. I feel that this is this is this is my skill set is this ophthalmic bioengineering. But to be able to do that, I have worked over my career with obviously with with other engineers, but also across the the university and across um, the, the whole academic community with, with chemists, with material scientists, with physicists, with cell biologists, with microbiologists. And, uh, and, and, and obviously very, very closely with, with the clinical community. Now to be able to um, communicate with all these different people, one has to learn the right vocabulary, I guess, is on the, on the simplest level, um, but also you have to be able to listen and understand what, what their expertise is and how you bring the, these different expertises together. And that's just looking at the science, if you like, or the science or the engineering. As academics, we also have to be able to, to uh, communicate clearly with research councils or, or other um, grant awarding bodies. And we need to be able to communicate with them in a different way. So how do we make our case that the work that we want to do is, is really important? I have to, um, or been very much engaged in, in working with industrialists as well, because if I want to make sure that my research is actually going to have an impact. I need to find somebody who's going to manufacture and, and develop these, these materials and devices so that they can then be used in clinical practice. And how we communicate with industrialists is different than the way in which we uh, communicate with, with, with other people. So you have to learn what it is that's of interest to them. Particularly important for me, though, is I also need to be able to talk to, to the patients that are ultimately going to use these, these devices or and, and, and what is appropriate to them. I, I need to be able to talk to the public and I need to be able to explain what I'm doing so that the public can understand that that's, that's appropriate. I've been involved with talking to patient support groups. So on many of the, the different areas where I'm involved with, 
there are pretty patient support groups, either local or national. And going and talking to them, you need to be able to understand what's important to them so that you can answer their questions without getting their hopes up so much that you're really going to solve their problems. Because ultimately, a lot of the things that we're doing in the laboratory are going to take a very long time to get to clinical practice. And, and it, it's really important that that message gets across that we're not going to be solving their problems straight away. And I've also been involved with various eye charities. Um, there, there are some of them that uh, fund research, but there are also some of them that are very keen on us that are doing research in this area, going out and talking to their communities in a way of trying to help more people to donate to their charities to understand why the, the research in this area is so important. What I plan to do today is to talk you know, to talk to you about my experience of how I communicate or how I change my communication, if you like, my, my skills to, talk, to get these points across to, to the various different groups. And, and I'm going to start very, very simply with, with, with what I do in terms of, of talking to my peers, because I think as academics, this is what we're most comfortable about. So I, I've just had a paper published, um, which is a, a, a paper that I'm, you know, I was really pleased to get published. This was published just, just a month ago now. And this was work that I was doing um, with a colleague of mine in Iron Vision Science, who's a, an ocular cell biologist, and a, and a PhD student, a, a very, very good PhD student. And this, this was actually her project. And we were working on diabetic retinopathy. So diabetic retinopathy is a disease that occurs at the back of the eye associated with the blood vessels um, that, that become damage due to diabetes in the retina and these micro micro vessels begin to leak basically they begin to bleed and then you get scarring and that scarring in the retina causes loss of vision it's associated very specifically with um, the, the cells within those blood vessels so you've got these retinal um, and uh, vascular endothelial cells and then you've got the parasites on the outside of the vessel so these are two cell types that are very important in terms of maintaining the integrity of these blood vessels. Our hypothesis for this piece of work was that if we could understand how these two cell types were behaving and how they behaved under disease conditions, we could then use that as a process for developing new therapies to try and treat this disease. And specifically what we were interested in was collecting um, endothelial progenitor cells from patients, putting them back into patients such that we could heal the, the cells within the, the microvasculature within the, um, within the retina. But what we needed to do was to set up a model so that we could actually try and understand what was going on. So we, um, we set up a model and then we collected data. Now, as, a, as, as academics, we're, we're, we're quite comfortable with this. We know how to set up our hypotheses. We know how to write, ask the right questions. And we know how to then design experiments to address those hypotheses, collect the data, and then draw conclusions from it. But if I look at some of the, the things that we did in this paper, so for example, this is our methodology. So we can put into a paper this, this, this sort of uh, schematic on how we, we develop this process. So we can grow our, our cells in, in culture, either on their own, just the retinal endothelial cells, or the parasites, or we can put them into cold culture. We can then make these um, uh, conditions so that they behave or they look like they've got diabetes. And we can then make these cells sick, if you like, so that we can then uh, try and see if we can treat them. And in, in a paper, you know, you write these, you, you, pre you present these uh, figures and they have complicated figure captions, which is really only, um, applicable to someone that wants to try and read this paper and maybe try and recreate your, your methodology. So if I was talking to, to uh, um, clinicians, I, I wouldn't possibly go to this much detail, but I'm presenting this in a paper in a way so that, that somebody can recreate this, this uh, experiment should they want to. I can then look at the data and if this is, uh, you know, you can't just look at this figure and say, oh, I can see what's going on here. You have to look very carefully at this figure. You have to look here at the quantification of the 
specific markers that tell us how these cells were behaving in this model. You need to look at the figure caption and you need to try and work out exactly what's going on. We can look at the, uh, the cells and how they're responding qualitatively looking at these pictures, but you have to look very carefully at what the particular marker of the cell is that we've that we've explained for here. You have to look at the conditions under which these cells are being grown. And then you have to uh, use that information to try and understand what's going on. This is not something that you can look at quickly and just understand what, what, what you're looking at here. You can look at the, the quantification of these, these uh, particular measurements about these cells. And we can look at, this is about quantification of, of cell of focal adhesions on those cells. So I think, you know, if we're looking at this as an academic, we can uh, present figures like this, but they're not perhaps very accessible to someone that's not understanding exactly what the, the experiments are and, and what you're doing. So this is only going to be relevant to certain particular people. This is data around the endothelial cells. We have a similar uh, figure around the parasites and the way in which they're behaving. And then we have um, a, a, an example of how, when we've put the two together, what is actually happening to these cells. And this is obviously just qualitative. Uh, it's much more difficult to do quantitative analysis here because the media is all together. Um, but you can, if, if you were reading this paper and you had got through this uh, to this far, you would understand the experiment that we've done and the data that was coming out of that experiment. And overall, this paper had about, uh, I think it was eight figures plus about 11 supplementary figures. And clearly, if you were looking at this paper, you'd have to go through all that information to work out exactly what was going on. And we can end up drawing some conclusions from that work. So we can show that, that, that these data uh, confirmed that we could grow these cells in, in long-term cultures either both uh, individually or um, in co-cultures. And this is something that people hadn't been able to do before. So this was, we had demonstrated that by, by building this model, we could get some information from this, which was going to be useful if somebody else wanted to do this. We could show that um, we could grow these, these cultures both as, as healthy cultures or in diabetic conditions. And we could keep these growing up to 21 days. And that that's really important because if you want to understand what the long-term effects of diabetic conditions are, you need to be able to do this over a period of time, longer period of time. And most people that have done this in the past have only looked up to seven days because the cells die in culture after that. So we've managed to develop conditions that allowed us to look at this longer. And that's really important in trying to then extrapolate from this to what might actually be happening in vivo. We showed that we got significant differences between growing these cells in monocultures or in co-cultures. And this is also very important because people hadn't done this before and they had tried to draw conclusions on the effect of diabetic conditions on either the, the uh, parasites or on the endothelial cells. But if you grew them together, you got different responses. And that perhaps isn't surprising because we know that in vivo, the two cells interact with each other and they have to be in direct contact with each other to be able to do that. So by setting up this model, we were actually able to demonstrate that this was happening. And then we think this actually allows us then to use this model to, to look at, at different potential treatments. It could be useful to pharmaceutical companies if they wanted to look at new pharmaceutical interventions. But in particular, what we've taken this model on to do is to then collect uh, these endothelial progenitor cells, which you can collect from from blood or from either cord blood or in fact from peripheral blood, and then potentially look to see that if we put these uh, endothelial cells back into the cultures, we can see that they actually begin to ca uh, cause uh, wound healing within those, those damaged cultures, those cultures that have been damaged by the, the diabetic conditions. So from an academic point of view, this is something that I think many of us can do. We feel very comfortable presenting this. We can, we feel comfortable about giving the data uh, because we know that we've collected the data in a very controlled way. We've got all the controls that we need to run with this, these data, and we can present them in a way that um, uh, provides us with confidence that the conclusions we can draw are, are what we are what we want and 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 and, and are what are useful to to the academic community. So this is something that as academics 
in our own fields we, we can all do. So then let me move on to talking about how you change things if you're uh, perhaps talking to or making your case to a, a funding body. And in this case, this is a, a different piece of work where uh, I have, were involved in um, developing a new way of cross-linking the cornea for treating a, a disease called keratoconus. So this is, um, and this was a particular call which was asked by the EPSLC, so this is the funding agency that I get most of my work from, although I, I also have funding from um, the MRC, the Medical Research Council. So this is the Engineering Physical Sciences Research Council. They had a call for what they called Translational Alliance Platforms, Platform Grants. This was um, a, a, a scheme that was set up by the EPSRC to ensure that they were getting impact out of the grants and, and funding they'd already given. So the scope of this call was that they wanted uh, to develop new and sustainable long-term translational partnerships, as it says here, to deliver impact from existing EPSRC uh, funding. So to be eligible, you had to have a live EPSRC grant, and you had to have um, an EPSRC grant with a, that was in a particular area, and one of the areas was, was related to the, the healthcare technologies. Um, and the interesting thing is you had to want to get impact out of this grant application that you hadn't mentioned in your original grant application. So in other words, they were looking for ways to develop impact from funding they'd already given that somebody hadn't perceived as something that would be able to come out of this funding that they had, that, that, that they, this, this work they had already funded. I wanted to make sure this was going to build a, build a new partnership and that that was going to lead to, to knowledge exchange. So I was, I was in a very fortunate position here that I happened to have um, an EPSRC fellowship at that time that was to develop new materials uh, uh, for uh, advanced materials for over, overcoming vision loss. So it was quite an open grant application. And we had developed a new uh, peptide uh, material, hydrogel, out of, um, and, and we were using it, in fact, uh, I, for both um, applications in, in contact lenses, which I'll talk about a bit later, but also in tissue engineering applications. And it so happened that the, the uh, idea I had was that the way in which we cross-link this peptide hydrogel could also be used to cross-link tissue. So this is a, a, a situation where we need to try and actually cross-link the cornea, the corneal tissue, in a patient to stiffen that, that, that uh, that tissue as a treatment for this for keratoconus. So I needed to make the case to the EPSLC that this was uh, an, a, there was an opportunity here to develop this as a new impact out of the particular piece of work I was doing, and I, that I wanted to work with a new partner to develop this application. So one of the things that uh, came across is that keratoconus as a disease is specifically a problem. The problem in the UK to about one in one in um, one in two thousand people in the UK will get keratoconus that needs treating. But actually, in the South Asian population, it's about ten times as as, as prevalent. And I had a new uh, collaboration with a group in India. So what I I made the case to the EPSRC that we needed to set up a a translational alliance where I could take this new idea that we had developed here in Liverpool to work with the Aravind eye care system in, in India. And the really nice thing, and I'll tell you a bit more about the Aravind eye care system, but it has a hospital, it has a research institute, and it has a small company that is involved in this system. So I made the case to the EPSRC that the Aravind eye care system was a, a, a really good uh, uh, group to work with because they are a, um, they're, they're a business but they also have a very nice uh, charitable status in that their whole ethos is around eliminating needless blindness. And so in India, you, you may be aware that healthcare, it has to be paid for, that there's, there's no healthcare system, but what the Aravind eye care system does is it'll treat all patients irrespective of whether they can afford to pay or not. Those that can afford to pay, pay a little bit more, 
and they then fund the people who can't afford to pay. And the people then who can't afford to pay get exactly the same treatment as the people who are paying, but they just, um, so, so they'll have the same uh, uh, operations, they'll have the same devices being used, but they probably don't have as, as nice a, a room that they're looked after in the, in, in the hospital, for example. So it's a really, really nice system. And the way that they achieve this is they set up this small company as part of the Arabian eye care system called Aura Labs. So what this company does is it makes, and it was all started or actually around intraocular lenses. So cataracts, as you, you may be aware, is a, a really big problem. And cataracts are treated by the removal of the the opaque lens and the and the implantation of a, a small plastic interocular lens. If they're done in the UK, you get a, a, an interocular lens that costs several thousand pounds. What happens in, in, in this company, therefore, they set it up to make exactly the same interocular lenses as are, 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 are used in, in, in the, the developed world, but they make them at the fraction of the price. And they do this by setting up their own small business and very nicely that the, they have a very um, nice system where the lens that not only are they um, made in their own facilities, which are uh, cheaper to run, they also um, train all the people that make them and put them through college at the same time. So they have a very uh, local um, societal benefit to the local community for when they're making these interocular lenses. So these interocular lenses, rather than selling for several thousand pounds, they're sold uh, uh, for a few pounds each. And this means that they can then be used within the Arabian eye care system at a very affordable price. So what we wanted to do in the case we made to the EPSRC is that we would develop our new cross-linking treatment with the Arabian eye care system and with the, um, or a lab or eventually developing the, uh, the solution as a, as a potential uh, for, for treating their local patient groups. So we then made the case that why keratoconus was, was a medical need, uh, why the current problems that they, or the current treatment for uh, keratoconus is, is, is a, has, has, has a detrimental effect. So for example, what happens with the current treatment for keratoconus, so perhaps I should explain that keratoconus is where you get a, a misshaping of the cornea at the, front of your, uh, at the front of the eye here. And this is due to a breakdown of the, the corneal, the collagen structure within the cornea. And if you, and therefore what you need to do is you need to stiffen this tissue so that you can then stop the progression of the disease any further. What they currently do to treat that is they actually scrape off the corneal epithelium, which is very painful. It will be done obviously under local anesthetic, but the, 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 the patients then have an extraordinarily painful eye for a few days after that. They then will put on riboflavin, and then they will shine UV light into there to cause cross-linking between the, the, the photosensitizer of the riboflavin and the, the, the tissues. And putting uh, UV light into someone's eye obviously causes uh, toxicity to the tissues in the in the cornea itself and is potentially dangerous to the longer term uh, effects within uh, the, uh, other, other tissues within the eye. What we made the case as our solution for this problem was that we could have make a chemical crosslinker, which is actually very simple. It takes part of an, a very standard uh, chemical process which, cross, which causes crosslinking or cross it, it within or causes a uh, amide bond formation in, within peptides. So if we take a diacid, as you can see here, to, with dicarboxylic acid, we can add the activators, which allow the uh, amine groups within the proteins to interact with the carboxylic acid groups and create an amide bond. And normally what you, they, they use this technology or this chemistry for is for building up peptides to proteins, and we're just using it so we're providing this cross-linking between two different proteins within that structure. The really nice thing about this is because it's a very small molecule, we can put it onto the cornea as an eye drop. You don't need to take the epithelium off because it'll penetrate through the epithelium and it'll stiffen the cornea uh, and, and by, by, by doing this cross-linking reaction. 
and we showed them that we had, oh, sorry, I wasn't going to show that data now, but we showed them that we had uh, some preliminary data that showed that if we treated the, the tissue in this way using ex vivo tissue, we got the same stiffening effect as the UV riboflavin treatment. So by making this case to the EPSRC that we had this new idea for a treatment that was needed clinically, that was particularly needed clinically in, in India, and we could set up a new partnership with this really nice setup in India where they would treat people irrespective of whether they could afford to pay or not, and that we could develop it as a, as a commercial product through their small um, business, the EPSRC agreed to, to fund this and we were able to do this project and create a, a, a very significant amount of data that demonstrated that this, uh, this treatment, this hypothesis that we had was able to create the stiffening, penetrate through the epithelium without uh, needing to take it off. We did this predominantly on ex vivo tissue in the, in using pig eyes in the UK, but we were also studying this in the in India in the labs there where they used ex, ex vivo human eyes, either eyes that had been donated uh, after people had died, or uh, on keratoconic tissue when these these patients were treated with a corneal transplant, which was the only alternative treatment option, which obviously isn't ideal. Um, uh, for, for many reasons. So at the end of this project, this is actually only a two-year project, and, and actually one of the other big advantages that came out of this is that one of my postdocs went over and worked in India for two months, and one of the postdocs from India came and worked in, in Liverpool for two months. And so we also got a really good uh, uh, collaboration going with, with this, this group, and this has led on to new projects working with that that department and uh, a new project that have also been funded. So what the next thing we needed to do with this particular project though is now to find a commercial partner within, within Europe because we can't rely on developing this uh, in this country without having a, a partner within, within this particular area. So I've also now been looking at how to present this work to try and find a, a commercial partner and clearly the commercial partner, the, what's of interest to them is, is different again. So from a commercial partner, they want to know what the market is and what the clinical need is. And they want to know what uh, the issues are around uh, um, uh, the value of the idea, if you like, in terms of patenting issues. So the university has filed a patent on this area. And uh, we now are talking to various commercial, potential commercial partners about whether this is something that they uh, would like to partner with us to take forward to the next step, which is to go into a preclinical study uh, in, in animals. So how do I then present this now to uh, a commercial partner? So uh, I've had a number of meetings with commercial partners recently. And again, I tend to start with, with this slide. You've already seen this slide. Uh, so again, I'm talking to them very much about what the clinical need is. So, so how many people are we likely to treat with this, uh, this, um, this product? So they need to know that, to know that if they invest into this and to work with us to take this forward into the next stages, are they actually going to be able to make value out of this as, as a product? So we particularly talking to them about uh, keratoconus, but it isn't a huge market. It, it's not a bad size market, but in terms of, of many products and the amount of investment we need to go that, this isn't a, isn't a huge market. However, talking with my clinical, clinical colleagues about this, there are other places where this could be useful. So for example, uh, you may be aware that people have LASIK treatment in terms of uh, treating um, short-sightedness, for example, and when you do LASIK treatment, you interact and you cut away and, and, and change the shape of the cornea uh, to, with using laser to uh, pr permanently change the thickness of the cornea. There are many concerns about doing that, that you might then actually end up with more people getting a keratoconic-like response. So in other words, the, the, the tissue changing here. 
people will not currently treat these patients with the current treatment because of the risks of the current treatment. If we had a much more gentle treatment, then they may well be able to be prepared to cross-link these, these patients. And this would be a much, much greater market uh, for a, 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 a commercial partner to take on. But as I say, we, we explain to them these issues. This is, this is the market. These are the problems with the current treatment. And again, this is, this is our solution. However, I then move on and give them uh, more, a little bit more information on, on some of the data that's coming out of that. So I can show to them that we've tested our, 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 our treatment on ex vivo pig eyes here. And I can show that I'm getting a, a stiffening and it's about 85% increase in stiffness, which is something that's clinically relevant. I can show that it's a, it's a, that there's not much difference in terms of the treatment as in, in terms of treatment time. And this is important for them because in fact, the current treatment takes probably 30 minutes to an hour. And actually we can do this in treatment in 15 minutes. And I can show that the amount of stiffening I'm getting is, is the same, very similar to the amount of stiffening that you get with the current treatment. So that, that we've not uh, got a, uh, you know, that the treatment is very similar in terms of the clinical outcomes, uh, in terms of stiffness as, as to what's currently available. And, and I can just show that, that when we've done this on, on human eyes, we get the same response as we do on, on, on pig eyes. Very importantly, I can show them that we've got data that demonstrates we've got incorporation of our cross-linker into the tissue. This shows that we've actually got a chemical change in the, in the, in the tissue, which explains why we're getting this, the increase in stiffness. And interestingly, this isn't the case with the current treatment. So there's no evidence with the current treatment that you're actually getting any chemical change. I can show them about uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, safety aspects of it. So this is, these are our um, histological data that shows that when we treat with our uh, chemical treatment, the tissue looks undamaged afterwards. It's exactly the same as if you just put phosphate stuff and saline on there. Whereas when you do the, do the current treatment on, on this ex vivo tissue, A, we've taken the epithelium off. So this lovely protective layer that you have on your, your cornea, we've had to scrape that off. And you can see that the, cell, the cells, there are no cells in here, basically the cells have died and they've been killed by the UV light. And this is an issue because this causes long-term haze and scarring within the, within the, the treatment. This tends to res, res, resolve itself over time. But if we don't have to damage that, if these, these cells can stay alive, that's obviously a big advantage. And these are the endothelial cells. These are the cells on the inside of the cornea that's here. These are very, very sensitive cells and absolutely critical that you don't damage them. If you damage your, your corneal endothelial cells, they're non-proliferative, they don't heal, and this is, causes a, a real problem. And this is the risk of the UV coming through here, is that you damage the endothelium, and we can show that where we don't get any damage to the endothelium uh, due to our chemical treatment. I can do, I've shown them data that uh, shows even more about safety. So we treat our, tish, our tissue, we then collect tissue from the treated uh, eye, and this is all ex vivo, and then we can put these into culture and we can show the cells grow out from this tissue in a healthy manner. So this is really important. If you do this with treatment that's been UV, UV treated, you get no cell outgrowth because the cells have been killed by the UV. This again will, is, is demonstration to the company that this is a product that is really going to be very safe. Uh, in, in, and therefore worth investing in. Uh, and then I have a small amount of study where we've actually put this onto live uh, rabbits. This is a very, very preliminary study. And uh, what demonstration here is that we don't get any toxicity uh, within the stroma. We do get a thinning of the epithelium, uh, but this is, uh, much of it has, has uh, recuperated after seven days. However, we know that this is a problem in terms of the pH of our solution. And so actually what we've done now is we've, we've coming up with a slight modification to our formulation so that we can uh, make this even safer for, um, for the next stage of our study. And so I can then explain to my, these, these commercial, potential commercial products, uh, uh, companies who I want to uh, consider them partnering with us 
is that this is where we are now. We've got a new formulation which can be, uh, we can keep at pH 7. We know that it's actually much more stable and therefore that's an advantage. We've got some preliminary data that we're currently collecting in, in, in rat, and, rat and rabbit studies, which is looking very hopeful. We've just put in an application to the MRC for a developmental funding scheme to do a, a longer term free clinical study. And doing this, we want to build a partnership with a, an industrial partner because we need somebody to partner with us to then take this onto a clinical trial afterwards. And uh, we've got, uh, we, we explained to them that we've got a patent that is covering the original formulation. Our new formulation, we haven't yet covered with a patent. So we are, can't actually tell them exactly what that is yet, but we are uh, going to develop this safety with them. And if we can get an NDA in, in place and they're willing to do that, then we can tell them more about our new, our new formulation. So the points I'm making to a commercial partner are different to the, uh, the, the points I was making and have made in my application to the MRC for a developmental funding uh, a, a DPFS, a development funding pathway scheme, that is a, a particular one for helping to translate this particular work. So then I want to move on to, uh, to, a, to a project I, I did um, very early on when I started working with St Paul's Eye Unit. And this was a project where I, um, I had to work out a way to explain to the clinicians that the physics uh, of what was going on in terms of, of, of treating retinal detachments. Basically, the clinicians came to us and said, we use silicon oil in treating retinal detachments in patients, but we want to work out how to make it work better. So this ended up with a, 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 a three-way collaboration between the University of Liverpool, which was myself and people from the Department of Physics, uh, a company called Fluoron that makes the silicon oil, and clinicians in St Paul's Eye Unit. So let me just talk about, explain to you what, what retinal uh, detachments or tamponade agents are. So a retinal detachment occurs in the back of the eye here. So the retina on the back here comes away from the underlying tissues. And if it doesn't get reattached to the underlying tissues, this part of the retina dies and you, and you to lose vision in that part of the retina. And sometimes this retina can come right off and end up washed down here in the bottom. So the clinician's basic principle is you either go in and you push from the outside and push these back into contact, or you go in here, put something in here and push the retina back onto the underlying tissues. And very often they can just do this with an air bubble. And if you put an air bubble into the eye here, you, this air bubble will float and it will push the retina back onto the underlying tissue. That's fine if the retinal detachment's at the top here. If the retinal detachment's at the bottom here, you then have to posture your patients and they have to lie with their head down, their face down to make sure the bubble then fits against the bottom of the, uh, the bit of the retina that needs to be pushed against it. So that's not ideal. And also the um, air bubble doesn't last forever, probably only lasts for a few days. So in fact, what they tend to do for longer term products or more complicated retinal attachments is they'll then use a silicon oil and they'll inject the silicon oil into here. And what they didn't understand was how the silicon oil was behaving within this tissue and how they could make it work better. And the particular considerations we needed to think about were the interfacial energies. So how does silicon oil interact? So silicon oil is a very hydrophobic material. How did it interact with the, inter the, the, the uh, hydrophilic inside the retina? Specific gravity, did it float or did it sink? And could we make it sink? and viscosity, it had to have a sufficient viscosity to be able to be injected and removed from the eye, but it had to not, you know, so it had to be a low enough viscosity to be able to inject, but a high enough viscosity not to emulsify when it was in the eye. And this was a problem that they had. So initially, we looked at this, this question of interfacial energetics because the clinicians didn't understand how the uh, silicon oil was interacting with the eye. So we built this model in the lab. It's just a, a very, very simple cylindrical model. And I treated the inside of this model so that it had a very hydrophilic surface. And this is an, an air bubble that's been put inside there. And you can see the shape of the air bubble. And that's dependent on the interfacial energetics and also the, the, the buoyancy forces that are affecting this. 
And as the bubble gets bigger, you can see that this, this fit, this, this begins to uh, interact with the inside of that surface. If we took a silicon oil bubble, because of the difference in the interface of energetics and the buoyancy of this, you can see that this has a different shape than the air bubble. And therefore, the amount of contact that this was forming is, is significantly less. And even if you fill it up really quite high, you can see that this is probably only contacting here, which means that it's not forming a really nice seal uh, at, at, at that point of the, um, uh, for, for very much of the surface. And what the clinicians were doing is that they would put a, a they would sew um, a, a piece of silicon rubber on the outside of the eye with the idea of pushing the, uh, the, um, the retina, or if you like, the, the, the sphera into the retina to try and cause a, um, a better contact. And because of the interfacial energetics, that's actually exactly the wrong thing to do because it pushes the bubble away rather than pushing it into contact with it. Whereas if you have an air bubble, you get a really nice seal around these, uh, this, these, these indents. If it's a silicon oil bubble, you, you've got an even worse seal. And this was when they put an encircling band on or sometimes they would just put a single one on. And so what we were able to show them that if they actually wanted to just put a single uh, um, indent as they call them onto the eye, they should put it at the opposite side of the eye than where the retinal tear was because you were pushing the bubble away. And this was a, a this is a, you know, a, was quite a difficult uh, explanation to make to the clinicians without this model. So to, by having a model, it allowed me to explain to them how their, their silicon oil droplet bubbles were actually working within this environment. We did the same thing working with a company that had made a, a silicon oil mixture that made it uh, with a high specific gravity. So it, it sank rather than, um, than floating as a silicon oil. But the specific gravity was only very slightly greater than one. So, so you didn't get a huge effect on the buoyancy. So you still had this poor contact of the bubble uh, with the inside of the, the surface. And what we really needed to do was to get something that was even heavier. So the specific gravity was greater than, the, more differential than one. Uh, but you couldn't do this by mixing the semi-fluorinated alkane that they were adding in. There was, a, there was a limit to how much they could add. But we did a study which demonstrated that by adding different amounts of this, you could change the shape of the bubble. What we then did was some work with, with the Department of Physics, actually, where we looked at um, the, the, the refractive index of the oil. So in this case, we've got a, um, a material where we've added silica. So this is solid silica. To the silicon oil. Well, if you add it to normal silicon oil, you end up with a cloudy material, which is clearly useless in terms of uh, uh, interacting with the, or something that's going to be in the, in the vitreous cavity. But if we change the, specific, the, the silicon oil very slightly, such that refractive index matching occurred, we've got the same amount of solid silica in here, but we can see now we've got a clarity. And this is just writing on the back of the, the oil to see that that's the case. And we could do a study that demonstrated if we modified the ratios of these two materials, we could end up with something that had really nice clarity across different uh, wavelengths. And by doing this and working with the clinicians, we could show them that we had a material that had potential to uh, be useful. Sadly, because the silicon oil is modified, the regulatory approval process was going to be extraordinarily expensive. So this ended up being no more than a, than a, a curiosity, if you like, a scientific curiosity. And we got some papers out of it, but it's not something that's going to be able to be taken forward. The importance of this work was to demonstrate if we needed to work with our clinicians and explain to them how the physics was actually working. We also then developed uh, this question of emulsification. So how could we deal with emulsification? And so we ended up uh, looking at something that is used in other areas where we, we modified the silicon oil by looking at in, in, in increasing its extensional viscosity. So we put a very small percentage of high molecular weight material into this silicon oil. And we could demonstrate that by doing this, we would get less emulsification with this material. But at the same time, we would keep a low shear viscosity and therefore still be able to inject this material. This was work that uh, actually was predominantly done with it in the Department of Physics in, in Liverpool. And we demonstrated that we could increase extensional viscosity, we could keep our shear viscosity low and our injectability, 
uh, which the clinicians was, was very important for clinicians. And in fact, we then worked with the company and were able to develop these products out of this, this idea and take this, this forward. And these are actually now products that the, the Fluoron manufactures themselves and uh, is, are, are being used to treat patients around the world. But this came out of work that uh, was a, a very uh, strong partnership between us and physics and St. Paul's Eye Unit and the company. And by getting everybody on board and being able to explain what was going on, we actually have ended up with a really nice output from this particular bit of work. Now I want to just move on now, talking a little bit more to the public and, and how um, I've, I've been involved in trying to explain work I do um, uh, to, to people who aren't really aware of the, the uh, or don't have the depth of knowledge around the science of, of what it is we're trying to do. And I, I've done this in terms of being part of the sidebar uh, uh, system, which is where you go into a pub and, uh, and you, you uh, give a presentation in a pub to a group of people. And what happens is you give a presentation for about 40 minutes. You then, there's a bit of a break while everyone goes and fills up their glasses again. And then you carry on and give an, a bit more of a presentation. And it's really fun. But the difficulty or the difficulty of me explaining this to you now is that when I tend to do this, I'll take a lot of props along with me and I'll hand them out so people can actually see what I'm talking about. Um, and I've done other similar things where I've been part of the Wirral Arts Festival and, and presenting that. So to do this, I need to start, if you like, further back in terms of, of making sure that people understand what it is I'm talking about. So I tend to start by talking about the anatomy of the eye and, and therefore so they can understand which parts of the eye we're talking about. And then, and then also talking about how um, light actually gets into the eye and, and how, we, how we actually see. And, uh, and, then, and then I'll talk about how the fact that if you link, think about this light path that's got to get through to all these different parts of the eye, if you can get a, 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 a blockage within that light path in, in any particular way, any particular part of this, that could be here, it could be in the lens, or it could be in terms of how it's actually interacted with the retina or how that retina passes information down the optic nerve, then any of those instances can cause a problem with vision loss. And then uh, I, can, I can move on to say, well, there are various different ways in which we can try and address various of these secondary. So we can look at things that are related to, to uh, corneal uh, reconstruction or contact lenses, intraocular lenses, tamponade agents, or in fact, some things that we've got in terms of tissue engineering sub -retinal. And I tend to then go on, and, and this work that I've done, particularly with the sidebar, is then gone on to talk about uh, contact lenses, because a lot of people know about contact lenses, and, and you know, it, it gives them something that they can uh, take on, on board in terms of understanding what's, what's important in terms of then developing contact lenses. So there are some properties that are very obvious, but there are some things around uh, that are perhaps less obvious around wetability and gas permeability that, that I can then uh, go on and explain to them how we can try and do things about that in terms of developing new material. We talk about wetability in the tear film and how most people think of tear film as just being a salty solution, but actually it's much more complicated than that. And why that's important in terms of how your eye maintains its health. And then I, I can talk to them about wetability. So um, here we can, little videos here on, on how I can explain to them about the wetability of materials uh, and how if you, if you have a low wettable material, then the, the, the tear film won't spread on that surface and then that's uncomfortable. Whereas if you've got a higher wettability surface, you can see how the water will, will spread on that surface and how that's obviously then going to be much more comfortable in terms of a a, a contact lens. And then I, I talk about normal contact lenses. So no, most uh, currently available contact lenses are a mixture of these two materials. So a silicone, which is a silicone rubber, which has a, 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 a low wettability, and a hydrogel, which has a high wettability. And depending on the audience, I can try to then explain to them why the chemistry of these particular materials changes the way in which these properties interact and how these are then mixed together in terms of a contact lens to make a contact lens that has a high oxygen permeability due to this material 
but a high wettability due to the sequina. And then using that as an experience, and I've usually got some of these materials to, for them to feel so they can see what these materials actually feel like. I then move on to talking about some materials that we've done where we've um, researched where we've developed these peptide hydrogels. And this is one that which we've created out of our new material and why this is an advantage uh, in terms of uh, making a material that is, is actually uh, an antimicrobial material because it's uh, made out of a material that's, that's not naturally antimicrobial and used as a food preservative. Uh, I then uh, will show them how we, what these materials look like, because most people think of, of hydrogels as being a very, very weak material. But you can see here, there's something that you can make. This is the material, it's stained blue, just so you can see it. But it has a, a property that is, is very similar to existing contact lenses. And I would take some of this material with me so that they know what it feels like. I would show them how good it is in terms of transparency. So you can see here, that this material uh, has, a, has a really good transparency. And this is obviously very important in terms of a contact lens. Um, and then one of the other big advantages of this material is that we can functionalize it. So we could actually take this material and we can put drugs into it. And I would talk to them about the problem that we all know about in terms of, of uh, getting uh, drugs into our eyes as we put eye drops in. We all know that about 95% of that runs down our cheek and therefore is, is, is ineffective way of, of giving drugs to the eye. If I can put my drugs into my contact lens and then put that contact lens onto the eye, then I can get much better release of those drugs onto the, onto the eye and to keep those in contact with the cornea so that we can treat infections. And so this is an, an area where we can explain how our science, if you like, is changing the way in which people contact lenses uh, can behave better and produce a better clinical outcome, either as a normal uh, naturally antimicrobial contact lens or as one that we can use as a drug delivery device. Well, now I'm running out of time here, but I just wanted to uh, give one last example where I, I, I talk to people, uh, patient user groups, and I think this is very important because this is, tends to be people who have vision loss and it's very important to them to understand what research we're doing that uh, can be used to explain how we, how we can improve their situation. And actually I genuinely make it clear that we're not actually probably doing changes that are going to affect them, but will affect the next generation of people who are coming along behind them. And they're usually very keen to help uh, treat, look for new treatments that even though they're not actually going to uh, possibly um, benefit it from them themselves. So macular, age-related macular generation is a particular area here and I will explain to them what this process is that's, uh, sorry, that uh, is occurring uh, and why they have a problem uh, here at the back of their retina uh, and, and how this then is, is beginning to, to lose, they, they're beginning to lose their vision associated with this damage that's occurring in this area. And then I talk about the new treatments we're trying to do, which is around a tissue engineering application where we would develop a substrate, we would grow cells on that substrate and put it back into uh, a patient uh, to removing the damaged tissue within those particular, in that particular area. But particularly, I would then try and explain to them how this would work. So we would talk about a, having a substrate, having cells, growing them in both in culture, and then taking that and look, making sure that these cells then grow onto that substrate to create this really nice monolayer of cells on the substrate. And then taking that substrate and looking at how we could put that back into a, a patient uh, through a surgical procedure, and then put the, the you can see here, the retina has been lifted, the uh, implant put underneath, and then the, the retina laid back down on top of that surface. And, and how that then has the potential to uh, treat the damage that's occurred in, in these people's eyes. And this is our, our subject that we're doing that. And then also I would talk to them about how, where we would get those cells from. So uh, there's a lot in the press about using um, stem cells for these applications. 
which I think a lot of the patients get a bit concerned about. And therefore, our, one of the things that I try to explain that in, in our way of doing it is to take cells from the patient themselves, from the iris, and then we can take those out in a very simple procedure. We can expand those in culture in the laboratory and then potentially put the patient's own cells back in under the retina. And, uh, and, and basically explaining this to them helps them to understand how this process could be a, um, a treatment in the future. It's not, and I explained to them very, very carefully that this is something that's going to take a long time to develop and that we're very much in the laboratory stages at the moment. Because I think one of the things that uh, can be very confusing to patients is they think that these solutions are something that's going to help them and is going to help them very rapidly. And I think that gives people uh, an unrealistic uh, understanding of, of where research actually really is. And I just wanted to uh, bring up one example I had to do here, which uh, as an academic is very, very difficult for us. We as academics tend to rely on slides, but I had to give a presentation to the Macular Society annual general meeting uh, one year. They asked me to go and present. And this was to a group of people down in London. It was about three to 400 people who were present at this annual general meeting. They were mostly uh, elderly people with age-related macular degeneration. And they, they told me that, that because a lot of them had very poor vision, they would rather I didn't use slides because that meant that those that couldn't see felt left out of the presentation. So I then had to explain what I've just gone through to you with you without using any slides. And I think this is something as academics, we're actually very bad at doing. And I had to try and explain this whole process just using words. And uh, I think this is something that we as academics should probably do a more practice with because it's actually very, very difficult to do. And I had to try and use examples, uh, for exa example, uh, that one of the materials we're currently using for this is actually expanded PTFE. And if you don't know that, that's, called, that's also known as Gore-Tex. And I had to explain to them, well, actually, you all know what Gore-Tex is because you have experience of it from other applications. And that was then how the uh, a material that they actually knew about. Um, but it's actually very, very difficult to do this. And I think it's something that uh, we and, and certainly our, our, um, our students should, should gain experience of, of how to give a presentation to people without using slides because we all, all rely on this. Uh, probably too much. Um, so I think that that was uh, uh, all I really wanted to say. Um, I'm I'm not sure I've I've answered any any uh, points, but if there are any questions that, that anyone would like to ask me about how I go about trying to do this, I'm I'm very willing to to try and answer them. Yeah, thank you, Rachel, for your fantastic presentation, and I think we got a deep insight of the um, variety you are presenting your information to convince funding bodies, to convince companies and explaining your, your paper um, and simplify it for, for the pub talks. And um, yeah, we have got one question from Nicola, please unmute yourself. Uh, hi, thank you very very much for the presentation. It was very interesting, and also just seeing the, the whole range of uh, people you have to talk to. Uh, I would be just interested in what is your process when you begin. So, at the beginning, how do you decide what information you will present for for those different uh, people? I guess I just would like to understand sort of the thinking process. Yeah, so so I mean, that's a, that's actually a really really important question. So you need to know your audience. So you need to think about how much. How much information does that audience or how much background knowledge does that audience have and if you um can understand how so, so that's that's probably the first thing how much background information do they you know how much background knowledge do they have so how can you uh how much background knowledge have you got to give them so that they can understand the points you want to make and then you have to understand what's important to them and I think that's what I was trying to say when I'm talking to a commercial partner, they don't really want to know often the nitty gritty of the science behind it, but they want to know what the potential impact of that work is or where it could be valuable. If you've got a, a patient user group, 
they want to know how this is going to help them and, in, and how long it's going to take before it's going to be a help to them. So I think you, I almost always get asked, when is this going to become a, a new product? When is this going to become a new treatment that, that, that can help me? And actually, to be honest with you, that's a very difficult question to answer. And particularly as a scientist or an engineer, as an, as an academic, we're often really working at the very beginning of these processes. And there's an awful lot of it that needs to be done after we've finished our bit. So somebody else, either a commercial partner or our clinical colleagues, they have to take this on and do testing on it after we've developed it as far as we can, if you see what I mean. So I think you, you do need to know your audience that you're talking to. And, and I think that's perhaps sometimes the most difficult thing to gauge. I, I, just one thing to add there, very often you find, I find with my public audience, their level of knowledge is much higher than you might imagine. So it's very, very important not to, not to speak down to them, not to dumb it down too much. And would you say that this um, sort of these insights into different audiences, so is this something you, um, with time, sort of gathered this information and this understanding, or were there some ways where you could do this also without the experience? Because this is what I'm trying to, especially for yeah. me, I find this is my problem, that when I don't have that experience, it's really, really hard to guess. So I think you, yeah, that's a very good point. Um, and I know, I, I think you develop it with experience. And I think this is where um, I think experience needs to start very early. So I, I, one of the things that we do in our department is we get almost all our PhD students to talk to our patient user group. We have a really good patient user group in St. Paul's, our unit, and they're very, very patient, uh, patient, patient patients. And, and they, uh, we, they will, Come and it's obviously difficult with COVID at the moment, but we get them together as a group. We 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 uh, and and we get our students to go and present their work to them, and they ask them really difficult questions, and say, "Well, we don't understand it. What do you mean by this?" And they so it helps the students to understand from very early on how much um, general knowledge they need to put into their uh, their projects when they're explaining them away from the very technical stuff. Because generally we're not very good at this. I mean, academics generally they like we like hiding behind the technical side because we understand it, and and I think we need to learn that that's not we need to learn how we can explain our technical expertise in a much much more uh, accessible way. But experience, I think, comes from experience. But I think you should talk to other people, and also use people. I I I, I certainly. Um, use my family and things like that. So I practice things on that and ask them how much they would understand if I explain yeah, that's, a, that's a very good tip. <laughs> okay, so it's, it's good to know that it will get better with experience. So that's reassuring, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, yeah, I have one. I can't raise my hand as I'm the host, but if you don't mind me just jumping in. Um, so I do, well, I used to do a bit of fair amount of uh, public engagement. Um, and I was wondering, in regards to working with the public, were there any kind of key mistakes uh, you or yourself um, or others have made about the public should be aware of and trying to engage? Like, you might have already addressed it, to be fair, but... I think you need to be, I think one of the things that I've found and uh, I feel very uncomfortable with is that uh, sometimes when I give uh, presentations to the public, people will contact me afterward and say, I want to be part of your clinical trial. You know, I, I've got vision loss and I want to be part of your clinical trial. And I, and I, and I say to them that we're, the clinical trial is not even going to start for another five years. Mm. And, and I think it's that issue that, that it's very important that we give a really realistic um, presentation to the public on how long these things take to get into into the the to real uh, impacts. And I think there's a temptation that we think we're going to solve a problem, and yet we have to realise that people who with with vision loss, it's it's a hugely important. It's one of the things that that really really worries people losing their vision. And I think if we give them too much of an optimistic 
idea that we've got a solution that's that's not fair i think that's really important that we get that right and i think it's really difficult to do and i think in the past there's a there's a there's been attempt i i myself have had a temptation to to say you know we've got something really exciting here without giving the make it really clear that this is actually very long term that that really the stuff we're doing here is on the bench and it's a long time from clinical practice so when you so when you're like um i suppose communicating like information and knowledge um i always find it much more engaging to try and type like a story or something but I guess from what I'm what, what I'm getting from what you're saying is it perhaps it's better just to kind of um, try and leave out any additional things that could potentially lead to misinterpretation. Um, yeah, I, I, I think so. You need to you do need to be very careful that it's not misinterpreted, and I think language is very very important in that respect. And I think perhaps as scientists, sometimes we're not particularly good at explaining things in a language yeah. that's understandable <laughs> to others. Um, and yeah, I, think, I, I don't know, but I, I get very excited sometimes about the data we have because I find it exciting and, and, and really interesting. And sometimes you can get that, you can get the wrong impression over by being too, too exciting. Mm. Yeah, I, I, so I think it's just trying to figure out what, like I suppose position or how to position yourself as a communicator whether it's just like you want to just present pure data but then I find just doing that people will interpret that through their own lenses and biases and come away with not necessarily what you said uh, but when sometimes you lead the message when it informs the other way and people go away with something that's probably a bit beyond what you meant to say so I think trying to get that balance is a bit difficult but yeah and I think the way you communicate it is different to anyone, whether you're writing a scientific publication or you're talking to the, to, to the public. And I think that's the important thing that I don't think we're necessarily very good at. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think sometimes uh, we like the data to speak for itself, but necessarily it doesn't, but it's trying yeah. to, yeah. I mean, you could imagine if you didn't, if you weren't excited about uh, your science in a grant application, you'd never get it funded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's definitely true. All right. Yeah. Thanks. That's food for thought. For thought. <laughs> I'm sorry. We've gone terribly over. I find these things very difficult to to um, time. Uh, all right. Does anyone have any other questions, please? So until someone else is raising the hand. I think it's really it's really important, as you said, looking at the audience and and what the purpose is of the talk of the paper or um, is, is really important to to consider because um, you know we, we talked recently about risk communication and, and what the media made about the pandemic. And I think uh, when I investigated or, or interviewed the participants, they were really frustrated about the, the role of the media. And, and this is probably the next part when you present some news and some, some research articles, you need to make sure um, that it's written that pro probably some of the journalists could, could understand the basic to, to communicate it as well, isn't it? Well, so I, I'm sure all of you, um, you know, seen some of the um, uh, Downing Street briefings and, and the slides they use in those Downing Street briefings are, 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 are frankly appalling. And some of them don't have Y axis labels and some of them have X axis labels you could never read. And they, you know, I think as a, I would say as an example of how not to present data to, <laughs> To the public, that's a that's a very good example of how not to do it. Um, I think it's uh, quite quite uh, disappointing, and 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 you know how somebody can understand what that data really means. I think is is very very bad, very difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not right. not mean to be political here at all, of course. <laughs> um. Yeah, we are still um, expecting questions if someone wants to ask anything else. The group is normally really, really busy <laughs> and interested. 
I, I think I've gone on too long, probably. <laughs> oh, sorry, do you mind if I just quickly ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, yeah, uh, first, thank you for the talk. Um, but it's a question regarding sort of clinical trials and reporting clinical trials. So the Oxford vaccine data has come out recently. There's been a lot of questions regarding how they're reporting clinical trials data. Apparently they're cherry picking, cherry picking only a select amount of data and the meta-analysis they're planning is only using a limited amount of trials, not the full phase three data. So this creates a lot of confusion when you have media outlets saying the end of the pandemic is near, great success, 90% effic efficacy rates. How do we avoid sending mixed messages when we have some researchers saying, you know, we have a very effective vaccine. We have another group of researchers saying, well, you're not using the data properly because in between is the public trying to figure out who they can trust. Yeah, I mean, there, there was a very interesting, someone was talking on the, on the Today programme about that this morning, and they were saying that most normally a clinical trial would not be first reported as a press release. And I think what's happened here is that, that the press, that, that they've, they've done a press release rather than looking at the, than, than publishing it, for example, in a, in a, in a peer reviewed journal. And normally that's what would happen, I think is it would be put in a peer review journal where all the data would be available and people would be able to assess that data properly. And what's happened is because it's gone out as a press release, they haven't shown all the data and therefore different people have picked up different aspects of that data. And that's been, you know, I, I agree with you entirely. It's, it's very, very confusing. And, and quite why they could average the 62% with the 90% or whatever it wasn't and make 72% or something, I have no idea. I mean, that didn't make any sense to me at all. I mean, I'm not a statistician and I see Paula Williamson's no longer here, but she was, was here earlier and I'm sure she would have something to say about, about the way that that was presented. And, and I agree with you, it's extremely confusing to the public. I mean, it's confusing to me and that, and you know, or probably all of us and, and we're intelligent scientists, you know, so if we can't understand it, surely that's very, very much more confusing for everybody else who aren't, who aren't trained in the same way that we are. So I would agree with you that it's a very bad way to present data and it should have been presented and I guess will eventually be presented in the peer review literature and then you'll have all the data and you could go to that and assess it. It's just, I feel like this is just being rushed out to market like a lot of other people have shown concerns about because vaccines take about five, six years development time usually. So I'm, I'm I, you know, I don't know the, the details about it any more than, than you do, probably, but I, I don't think it's been rushed unsafely. I think that the information that's coming out is being rushed out without it being full, but I'm not, I wouldn't be so concerned that the assessment of safety isn't being done properly. It's more the efficacy that I'm worried about. It's safety, I'm sure that'll be fine, because again, you would do that in your uh, phase zero trials anyway. You would assess the safety of it in your phase one. But I think the publicity of it, though, is bad, isn't it? The way it's been reported is, is, is very confusing. I think that's the biggest concern right now is like media outlets are reporting different things based on whether they want the vaccine to succeed or not, rather than what the data is actually showing. But it's just how do we address that as scientists? Do we publicly come out and say this is an issue? Do we audit these clinical trials when they're released as press releases rather than as a published meta-analysis? So that, I'm a good question. Um, personally, I would always want to look at all the data before I open my mouth to make a complaint. So I probably wouldn't complain publicly without having looked at all the data. So I would probably wait till the data has been, in fact, I think the Oxford trial has been published in the Lancet, if I remember rightly, there's something has come out in the Lancet. So you should probably look at that and then look, then compare that with what the press is saying. So I suspect the press has picked up the bits it wants to hear. All right, well, thank you very much for that actually. So having said that, vaccines is not my area of expertise. No, but it's, yeah, so it's a good point um, when you said, because I, I think it's a question of, are we responsible as well as scientists to um, correct some false information? Or as you said, 
um, what what is our ethical ethical responsibilities behind this? Yeah, mm -hmm. um, I mean, some people have have gone on on and tried to to pick pick some some of the other aspects up. I, I, I think. Um, it comes back to to having the knowledge to assess the data that's there. I think you know I I wouldn't want to um, complain about somebody's work without reading all the data and, and really making sure that that that's what the data is actually saying. Because they, they may be misquoted. It, it may not be the Oxford vaccine group's fault. They they may be being misquoted by somebody else, and they may actually have put out all the real data. Mm hmm. Yeah, this happened a lot already. Yeah. 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 Any more questions for Rachel to challenge her or thank her? <laughs> and I d just going back to that point about about uh, you know what I do think we do ourselves need to be confident about the data that we put out. I think it's very important that that if you do put data out in the public domain, that you are that that data is absolutely squeaky clean if you know what I mean you know and, and you know exactly where it's come from and how it's been generated and uh, are completely confident that what you're presenting is, is is right and I think as academics we generally do that I and mean, that's the way we feel that, that the worry is when somebody misquotes your data so you need to make sure that you've put it out there in a way that that is totally unambiguous hmm. Yeah, and this might be the, the hardest point because even even if you put the right data on and they're a clear like water, um, it can be still misunderstood. Yeah, yeah I would say if, if no other questions arise, I would say really big thank you, Rachel, for your talk <laughs> and interesting insight on, on your work as well. So it was really interesting to see what, what you achieved already. And uh, thanking the audience as well for joining. Oh, Pedro has another question. Sorry, yeah, go on, Pedro. Uh, clap reaction. Sorry, <laughs> just thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right. <laughs> no, thank you very much. And um, I'm looking forward to work with you in a couple of weeks again with with Asan as well and and the aging CDG. Yes. yes, I'm hoping to get some of these uh, uh, sessions set up quite soon. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank All right, you're very welcome. Yeah, I'm, I'm giving to Simon to close the... <laughs>